This is a basic class that, that's just something that I do uh, once a month in different places that normally takes five hours, which is probably one of the most grueling five hours you'll ever spend. So today is going to be a much more relaxed and uh, a relatively hands-on, informative kind of thing to, so you can get a grip on the real basics on, on how to do things with your camera instead of just having it on automatic. I mean, when you put your camera on automatic, it kind of does everything for you and you get this great shot and the next time you want to get that same great shot, you have no idea how you got it, so you can't really do it. So the, the purpose of this is to take more than just one shot, a great shot, be able to redo and do it over and over and you'll enjoy yourself, you know, there's no doubt about it. So, I stuck this picture up here because this, this poor truck is still running. It has 350,000 miles on it. I've taken it all over the country. And as you can see, I've got a background on top, lighting in the back. I've, I've been everywhere and just have a blast doing it. Um, I'm leaving here today directly to uh, go to Texas to do an event. And then from Texas, I go to Disney. And I'm driving. I'm not driving this guy. Ford has actually given me a brand new Ford Edge to test drive the entire time, which is not a terrible thing, you know, <laughs> especially since it's the turbo model, <laughs> although the color is called electric spice. And believe me when I tell you, when you see it on the road, you will know that it's electric spice. It's like a yellow, gold, really bright, scary kind of color. But so without further ado, I'm going to jump into starting with lighting okay so now this next slide is probably how you feel when you first got your camera All right. this was a little kid that I asked make a nice funny face for your dad it was a military family shot so every time I see this picture I just laugh but it's just like what the manufacturer says when you pick up your instruction manual it's like you're never gonna be able to figure it out alright so that being said Let's talk about light. Light is the most important thing you could possibly learn for good photographs. Everything's about lights, how you capture it. So whether you capture your light on a digital camera or you're capturing it in film, it doesn't make any difference, it's still all about light. So the only difference is, instead of a piece of film, your camera now has a sensor and way more options to do more things. However, all those options are probably the most confusing thing in the world when you get that camera because it's not as simple as f-stop, shutter speed, and ISO. Because right away you go past those basics and you start looking into all this other stuff and you're like, I don't know what any of that means. Well, the basics still hold true to every digital camera. It doesn't matter what size it is, doesn't matter whether it's you know, a little point and shoot, whatever. You still need the ISO, you need aperture, which is an f-stop, aperture f-stop, same thing, and a shutter speed, right? So we're gonna go through those three things in depth so that at the end of this, you're gonna be able to understand how you can make motion, you can freeze motion, you can get the depth of field for uh, a landscape photo or a shallow depth of field where you have the background blurry and the foreground in focus, right? So that kind of thing we're gonna play around with and get those things out of the way. And then towards the end, we're gonna talk about some white balance and then we're gonna talk about composition. All right, so white balance is a little tricky and that's something you need to know as well. And there's presets in your camera. There's also part of that on the handout. So lighting, there's a reason why when you go on a photo tour that you go out early morning and late evening because you've got what's called golden hour. This is five o'clock at night. The sun came down. As it was landing, you see all the shadows that are here. Everything is, just turns to magic at that point. The same holds true in the morning. You get nice morning light and you get a great look. Right? And there's something else called the blue hour. And that's, that's somewhere right around dusk where you still, with the digital sensor, still pick up a little bit of blue in the sky even though you don't see it. But midday, I can't use this room for midday because the lights are hitting me in the face. Midday light is straight down. So 12 o'clock, the light's coming straight down. So if you imagine light coming straight down, it casts shadows on, on a person or it fills in every little nook and cranny on any kind of um, texture you may have. So if you're in Death Valley and you're there at noon, 
not only is it 100 and some odd degrees, but the detail is flat because all light is coming straight down and there are no shadows. So the waves that are in the sand and the, the, the flowers or whatever else might be there, there's no shadow, so there's really not the kind of detail you want in a really great photo. So you try to go out, when I lead a workshop, I always plan on getting up early in the morning, going out and shooting until about 11 o'clock, and then at 11 o'clock we start looking for things for to have lunch, do some things indoors, and then we work our way back out for the uh, sunset shot. And then we work our way you know, around the golden, golden hour. So that being said, this light works the same way on landscapes as it does with people. Now this shot, this was taken at a rest area that I stopped on on my way back from Sturgis, which was a, this year was the 100th anniversary of Sturgis Motorcycle Rally in, in South Dakota. This guy was just hanging out at a rest area and I looked at him and he looked really interesting and I started to talk to him and the, the funny part was this guy, if you looked at it, he was on a motorcycle and he had taken everything off his motorcycle and it was spread out around the motorcycle. It looked like there was no way in the world that this stuff was ever attached to a motorcycle because it was so much stuff. And I walked over to him and I asked him what was going on and he said, oh, you know, I had a problem with the bike so I had to take the parts so I could get out the motor and now I got to put all this stuff back on but I can't figure out how to do it. So I gave him a bunch of tie downs and bungees that I had in my truck but then I said, you know, would you mind if I take a photograph? And I had him turn right into the sun and this light just hit his face. I snapped two shots and the light was just incredible. It's so dramatic, it just lit him up and it just worked perfectly. Now, I shot it in black and white purposely because I really liked the, the expression on his face and I liked the gray beard and everything else. And the golden light didn't look quite as good as this black and white. The black and white had a much more dramatic look to it. But this kind of light, and he said to me, the first thing he said, man, I can't, you know, this is really bright. I said, yeah, but trust me, it'll look good. So we just looked and I, I grabbed two quick shots. But this kind of light is what you look for when you're photographing people or you're photographing landscapes, flowers, anything. Early morning light, late evening light is definitely the way to go. Uh, it, it, it adds so much more to your photograph and it's just a much better way to do it. Anybody have any questions about that, about morning light? Have you guys been on tours where you've gone out most of the time it's early morning where they, you know, they should take you out early morning and stick you shopping somewhere or at lunch during the, the midday. All right, so this lighting holds true to this too. Any kind of wildlife photography, you try to look for the best light you possibly can get. Usually side light works the best, same as if you use a flash, which I don't usually use a flash unless I absolutely have to, Side light gives you much more drama. It gives you drama in, in animals, it gives you drama in people. This kind of light, this was, the bird was about to take off, this was in, in Costa Rica. The light just hit this bird the right way. It was in the shadow and then a beam of light came through and just lit up the feathers. So it's all about kind of being in the right place at the right time as well. You gotta be really patient for some things and wait, Ansel Adams would sit for hours and days waiting for the light to be right to get it to where he wanted it to be. And it's a great way to, I mean, I, I use photography pretty much as, as a way of life, but also as therapy. So when I go out, I'm just hanging out. I'm in a zone somewhere and I'm concentrating on my subject and not worrying about where I have to go or what I have to do, whether the weather's bad or it's good. And plenty of times people have said, are you cold? And I'm like, ah, you know, I really haven't given it any thought. I've just been, you know, in, in, that, in that moment. And the same holds true to this. Now, this shot was taken. I got to tell you, this was one of the most difficult photographs. I was on a boat. So the bird was moving, the boat was moving, and I was moving. And it was one of those things where I shot probably, I don't know how many photos before I was happy with getting the image nice and crisp and sharp and adjusting my shutter speed accordingly. This was taken at night using a flashlight in the, in, in the jungle of Costa Rica, using a flashlight. So again, if you don't have light, 
You either use what you have or you create it. So using a flashlight, I'm able to get this, this is a bright little LED light. It's very bright. So it actually can pretty much overpower things even during the day. So if I'm trying to do something creative and I don't have the great light, you can do something and you can underexpose your photo. And I'm going to show you how to do that. You underexpose your photo and you can use a flashlight to shine on either a flower or even a person or whatever. And it, it highlights that with the light that you like that, that really pops. And you can get a great photograph. You can go out in the middle of the day and take a picture with a dark background using a light like this and getting a great light. This was 3600 ISO in the dark with a little flashlight on that guy. And it worked out great. It was a lot of fun. Walking around the jungle at night with a flashlight is also interesting. <laughs> Luckily, there were frogs and nothing else. You know, the mountain lion wasn't in, wasn't in the jungle. OK, so now, here's where we get complicated. We know that light creates all this stuff. The light is the important part. You have to have it in order to make the photograph. But now, these are all the numbers that are going to make things happen. And they all are connected to one another. You have the aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. I'm going to go through ISO first. The ISO is an interesting, interesting thing. It's the amount of light your camera sees. It's the sensitivity your sensor has to light in the camera. So the way I explain it is if you have, you're working with, say, a 50-watt light bulb, and that may be ISO 50. So you've got 50 watts of light you're working with, and it's too dark. You can't get what you want to get. You need to add more light. Well, you can't add more light if you, if you physically don't have any lights to turn on. You can't add more light. By adding more ISO and adjusting the ISO from 50 to 100 ISO, you've essentially doubled the light. You've added another 50 watt light bulb only in the camera. So you're adding more light to your subject just by raising those numbers in the camera to get more light. And you can continue to do that. And as you do that, the shutter speed and the aperture go up as well. And that's where things start to happen. When you start using these things to either create motion, freeze motion, or the greater depth of field, the little depth of field. Right? So the ISO is really important to understand. A lot of people think that they need to raise the ISO to change your exposure. And that's not the case in most cases. In manual mode, yes. But for everyone else, every time you raise the ISO, if your camera's in any kind of an automatic mode, it just compensates for it. The numbers go up, but your exposure looks exactly the same. So it's not going to make your image lighter or darker unless you're in a manual mode. So let's start with the shutter speeds. Right? You have shutter speeds on the side here. So one second, if your camera stays open for one full second, if you're taking a picture, say, of a waterfall, and you want that super smooth water, almost looks like a bridal veil type fabric, that's a one second exposure because everything around that's not moving is frozen and solid. But the water's moving, so it's going to cause motion, and it causes it to be blurred. As the speeds go up, it starts to freeze things. So you can make the water start to take shape. And then all of a sudden, at the end, you've got the water droplets in the air frozen. Right? So the good thing about working with shutter speeds and understanding what they do is you can make a relatively boring photograph interesting by creating some motion in it. So if I'm in Grand Central Terminal, Grand Central is a busy, busy place. If I go in there and I use a high shutter speed and I freeze everything that's going on, it just looks like everybody's frozen. So there's not really any kind of excitement. If you use a slower shutter speed, somewhere in the ballpark of, say, a 30th of a second or a 60th of a second, the people that are running by with their suitcases will be blurry. Everything that's not moving will be sharp and clear. So now you have a, a still image that's got motion that's far more interesting than an image that's completely frozen. 
And the same holds true to, say, say you're photographing a race car. When you photograph a race car, you usually pan with the car. When you pan with the car, it gives that blurred background, the tires are blurry, and the car is nice and clear because you're actually following along with a shutter speed that'll work to freeze just the car and not the tires or the background. My client, when I first started shooting NASCAR and Indy cars, said to me, I want everything to be clear and sharp. So I said, well, all right, well you're not going to like it. And he's like, well, you, I'll tell you whether I like it or not. You know? He's a client and let him do what he wanted to do. So, I raised my shutter speed when the car came around the bend. It was doing 100 and some odd miles an hour. I clicked the shutter. I froze it like it was parked. Car was stopped. Tires were frozen. The people in the stands were all just perfectly clear and sharp. And the customer was like, that's terrible. It looks like the car's parked. I said, yeah, exactly. So that's where you use your, your shutter speed to figure out a good shutter speed, to follow the car, take the shot, pan with it, and you get that super smooth blurred background, but yet the car is clear and sharp. All about shutter speeds, right? So now, there's some things you want to freeze. Say you're at a rodeo. You want to freeze a cowboy you know, jumping off the horse to, to tackle a, a steer. That's going to be a high shutter speed, and that's purposely what you're going to want to do. So you get up and you crank up your shutter speed to the highest one, up, up past here to like one one thousandth of a second. Most of the cameras that you have right now all go to one four thousandth of a second or even one eight thousandth of a second. I mean, a couple of the cameras that I have, I have one sixteen thousandth of a second. You can freeze anything. And that's just amazing. But this is the kind of thing where when you go up like this, though, see what it says, less light, faster, freezes action. The problem is, at a two fiftieth, five hundred, one thousand, it's opening and closing really fast, and you need a lot of light to do that. So in order to get that light, if it's not that bright outside, you raise your ISO. Your ISO brings those numbers up and gives you the amount of light you need to achieve a high shutter speed. The aperture on the other side, which is the opening in the lens, the bigger the opening, the more light's letting through. The smaller the opening, the less light. Interesting part about the aperture is that at f22, it's a very small opening. Big number, f22. You think you get mixed up. Think big number, big opening. It's big number, small opening. You don't want to get confused. So if you have f22, the way those numbers work is that small opening is going to give you the most depth of field. Your feet will be in focus all the way out to the horizon line. So, but again, at f22, little tiny hole, you're going to need more light to do that, especially if you're hand holding the camera. So it all boils down to your ISO going up and down in order to give you the kind of light you need for the type of exposure you're looking for. At 1.4 or f2, 2.8, that's when your background is super shallow. So now the subject has a very, say the face is in focus and the background is out of focus. And it can be to a point where the nose is in focus and the ears are out of focus. It can be that shallow with, a, like say, a 1.4 or 1.2 lens. So all these things all pertain to how much light you have to work with. So light is definitely the key, and it's really good to understand how all this stuff works. So 100 ISO, 200, 400, every time you go from one to the next, you're doubling the amount of light your camera sees with the sensor. So you all remember, if anybody shot film, anybody shoot film? So you had 100, 400, 800, 1,000 speed film. When 400 speed came out, everybody thought that was the greatest thing since sliced bread because you had, that was the middle of the road. So now you could actually shoot sports and you, you could still get a pretty decent photo without too much grain, right? So that's another thing you have to deal with with the higher ISOs in a digital camera. If you get a higher ISO, the higher it goes up, the more digital noise you start to see. So you definitely don't want to have, say, a point and shoot camera or a camera that's not a relatively new sensor, 
The older cameras are far more sensitive and have more noise. I should say less sensitive. Um, so at 6400, you're going to start seeing pixelation. And pixels are different than grain. Grain was a little nicer. It was a little easier to deal with because it was smoother and it was more like round little granules of sand. Pixels are just ugly little color pixels. They show up in the darker areas of your frame and of your subject and they tend to be you know, noticeably ugly. So what you can do is there's plenty of noise reduction programs that you can use to reduce noise. And it reduces something. There's some noise reduction programs that are really good. You have to be careful what you use because when you reduce noise, you tend to reduce the sharpness. And that gets to be a pain. If you reduce the noise too much, then your picture starts to get a little bit soft. Experimenting with shutter speeds is probably one of the most interesting things to do to add excitement to your, to your photos. Because when I was saying about a waterfall before, having a water, waterfall is the greatest thing ever. Because you go to the waterfall, you start out with a slow exposure, and you get that real smooth water, and you just start raising your shutter speed up. And as you raise the shutter speed up, the water starts to take shape. And as it takes shape, you're finally to the point where now every droplet that's splashing off a rock is frozen. So you can pick anywhere from that point in between and decide what you want, what you like. Because, you know, I mean, everything, what, what I like and you like, probably two different things. No number you, I mean, you just have to experience. Well, see, that's the problem. The, the, all these numbers all depends on how fast something's moving. I mean, I can tell you that at a, at a half a second or a one second exposure, if you're doing a waterfall, that the water's going to be nice and smooth. I know that for a fact. But as you start to get up to the 60th of a second, you'll still have motion in the water, but it won't be nearly as much as it will be at half a second. So as it starts to get higher and higher, 250, 500, 1,000, then it's going to start really freezing. And when you get up past one one thousandth of a second, it's a whole other, whole other world. You, you, everything freezes, all right? So testing this out, what I would do, now, on the top of your camera, if you have your camera with you, you have the S mode, or if you have a Canon camera, it's a TV mode. And TV means time value. Very confusing. I think Canon throws that out there to completely foul you up nowadays. People see TV and they're right away like, what the heck is that? Um, the TV or the S mode. So if you put it on your S mode up on top, that's your shutter speeds. So that's going to give you the option to set the shutter speed, and the camera is going to pick the, the corresponding aperture to give you the correct exposure. So for those of you who have your camera, if you can speak up and ask me any questions you might have, just make sure you got what you're looking for. Because it really is a big help. Because man, I tell you, I can run out there and I can set shutter speeds and I know exactly what I'm going to get. And I know that I'm going to get a, a motion, especially if I'm in Grand Central. I shoot RAW and JPEG. Now, I'm going to, as long as you brought that up, let me just talk about that a little bit. Um, for those of you who have no idea what that means, there's two things in your camera. You can shoot RAW and JPEG, or you can shoot both. A JPEG is what your camera is set up to shoot from the factory. A JPEG is, is a compressed preset file that your camera picks, kind of picks the colors and picks everything else that it thinks is right. Now, for most of you, when you look at your picture on the back of the camera and you like it, you're perfectly happy with it. and You don't have to worry about it. For somebody that's shooting for a living, shooting a raw file, and a JPEG. The JPEG's a much smaller file, and the RAW file is a very large file. The RAW file is a non-destructive file. So it's designed for you to be able to work on it in post and have it not fall apart. A JPEG, you can work on it in post. You can lighten it and darken it, and you can do different things to it, but you just don't copy it a bunch of times. Because what happens is, with a JPEG, it is a destructive file. What happens is, if you make a copy of a copy, it loses a little. And then that copy gets copied again, and it loses a little more. So by the time you copy a copy, 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 it just starts to fall apart. So the trick is, if you do work on a JPEG, is every time you do something to it, you don't save it. 
you do several things to it and save it one time and then always keep your original. You save it as a copy, but you only save it one time. And you can get away with that. I've made big prints out of JPEGs and they look fine, providing you don't work them to death because then they look like they've been worked to death. They're over sharpened and they're all, all kinds of different things. So if you're not, if you have no interest in going into your computer to process a raw file, then don't shoot raw. If you want to work on your photos and adjust all your highlights and shadows and pull, a raw file has more data. It has more information that you can pull from. So even on a day where the sky might not look that great, you bring that into Lightroom or you bring it into Photoshop and you use one of the sliders and you'll pull detail out of the sky in a raw file where you won't have that much information in a, in a JPEG. Right? So it's, if you're looking to expand your photography into the computer side, into the post-processing side, then a raw file is something that you would want to do. I always shoot raw and JPEG because the raw file is not a photo file. So I can't take that raw file and make a print from it. I actually have to put it in the computer, I have to process it, and I have to save it as a photo file, whether that be a JPEG or a TIFF or something, another type of photo file. So if you take, and I had a friend of mine shoot all raw because he was told that he should only shoot in the manual mode and shoot raw. And no one ever told him why. So the poor guy shoots his wife's birthday party and he shoots 175 raw files and he goes to CVS and he plugs the card into it and it says file cannot be read. And, and the guy's having a nervous breakdown because his wife's birthday party and he thinks all his files are no good. And then he called me and I told him, well, you, did you shoot raw? And he's like, of course I did. And he was very proud of the fact that he did. I was like, for a birthday party? Why, why would you do that? And he's like, well, well, I was told that I should be doing it. I said, man, you need to just, you know, you need to chill. You need, you need to relax. You don't have to shoot raw at a birthday party. If these are just pictures you're gonna make four by sixes and pass out to the family, go for it, you know? But that's a whole other myth, you know? I, I, there's a guy who runs around New York City all the time and just says, I shoot raw, and, it, and it's like, he, he makes it sound like that's what you should do and there should be no other options. I'm all about doing whatever works for for the individual who's, who's shooting. I mean, you may not ever shoot raw and be perfectly happy with what you're doing. The easiest thing to do, and what I do all the time, is I have my camera set for JPEG most of the time, depending on what I'm doing. Um, but most of the time, if I'm just doing stuff for social media and I'm banging stuff out, it's fine. But as soon as I start to get serious and I'm thinking, wow, this is gonna be something I might wanna play with, I'll automatically put it into raw and JPEG and then I can just have both files. And then if I don't want them, at some point I just you know, can get rid of them. But it's, it's certainly good to have it if you've got that shot in a million that you really love and you decide you wanna make a big print in your house, to have a raw file and be able to do that, you're gonna get a much better resolution out of it. This whole triangle, I mean it's complicated. You look at it, it's just a bunch of numbers and it's just when you first see it, it's like, when I first looked at this, I was like, how am I gonna pull this off and explain this? I mean, it's easy for me to figure out, but it's very hard for me to, to translate the whole thing to someone else. So to start out with, what I normally do is, is have everyone, you should always do one of these things at a time. You always have to work with your ISO, but you go to shutter priority and work one day with shutter priority and practice with it, pan some things freeze some things. One of the fun things too, panning, right? So you're following a subject that's moving and you're freezing that particular subject and you're blurring the background. Now there's something really easy to do, it's the op absolute opposite. So I go down to the Flatiron building and I wanna take a really cool shot, but I really don't wanna have parked cars in the shot or freeze the cars that are moving. So if I shoot that at a slower speed, say even a 60th of a second, which I can hand hold, I can take that and the cars that are going by will blur, but the building will be clear. So it's the exact opposite of panning. And it's actually fun. Again, you stand on a corner and you get some really cool shots. People going by, everything's starting to blur, but yet the building and everything else is nice and clear. So it gives you the ability to play with motion. And then another day you go out and you decide, I'm gonna try the aperture. 
and I'm going to work with the aperture priority. And you can do the same thing there, but you work with your depth of field. So you do a shallow depth of field with a flower, and then you start upping your f-stop. The f-stop starts getting higher. Things start getting in focus. So it's, it's, it's really a lot of fun to start doing different things because you start really appreciating what your camera can do rather than having it do it by itself and having no, no idea how it did it. So on that top dial, you have P, S, M, and M, uh, P, S, A, and M. The P mode is not professional, it's program. A friend of mine always calls it the professional mode. But put it in P, now what that does is that sets the aperture and the shutter speed for you. Does both. And it does it in a way that it's sort of the middle of the road. So it's giving you a good exposure, but it doesn't know whether you want shallow depth of field or you want deep depth of field. Doesn't know whether or not you, you're shooting motion. Do I want to freeze motion or do I want to create it? It's just giving you a good shot. So when you use your shutter priority or your aperture priority, depending on what you want to shoot, one of the examples is if you were in the program mode and you were on the beach and you were doing a beach scene and it looked great, you took the shot, exposure was perfect, and then you notice that to the right there's a really intense beach volleyball game going on. So you turn your camera and you start firing at the volleyball game, but you notice the exposure is beautiful, but the volleyball players are blurry. It's because your camera doesn't know that things are moving. It's not that smart. Smart, but not that smart. So things are blurry. So in that case, if you're in the program mode, you can switch to the shutter priority mode and raise your shutter speed up. The exposure will still look the same, but now you're going to freeze the motion. It's still going to be a beautiful shot. It's going to look the same as it did before, but now the people are not going to be blurry. They're going to be clear because you've moved your shutter speed up to freeze the motion. So in that case, shutter priority works well because you're not really that concerned about what's going on on the other side. You're more concerned about freezing the motion. So if you raise your shutter speed up to, say, 500th of a second, and you find that your aperture on the other side is going to set it automatically, if it sets it at f4, it's going to be a little shallow. So if you want more in focus, add more light. So that just brings up your ISO. You bring your ISO up a little bit, and it'll take care of it for you. So it's all about adding the light. The more light you add to the camera with via ISO gives you the ability to have higher shutter speeds and also higher apertures as well, because it's seeing so much more light. Right? Here's one that's even worse. But this is actually easier to understand. So this one's a little bit easier. All right. So you have the large opening, and here's what it shows you. You see here, you have the 1.4, and the background's completely obliterated. As you move further over to F22 and 32, now you have that person and the mountains in the background clear and sharp. So the wider the opening, shallower the depth of field, the smaller the opening, the sharper everything is. And here you have your shutter speeds. 1,000, frozen, starts to go down. As the speeds get slower, you start to see more motion. And in this one, the ISO. You see the ISO start to fall apart. This says 800. Eh, it depends on a camera. Uh, on a point and shoot, yeah. Starts to get noisy as you get further along. I have yet to see a camera that shoots 25,600 ISO that's not noisy. So uh, even that has to be processed properly to do that. I mean, that's probably the closest one. I mean, somebody shot. Andy Katz, a friend of mine who's a, a Sony artisan, sent me a picture. And he said, you got to see this. He said, I took this picture in the dark. And there was a deer there. He couldn't see it. He took the picture. It was dark. And, and it looked like daylight. And there was a deer standing there looking at him. And, and he thought it was the greatest thing ever. It's pretty cool. Yeah, there's some pretty cool stuff out there. Some of the, uh, some of the big full frame uh, Canons and Nikon, the, the new Nikon, the, what is it, Sean, the D5? D5 shoots at a, it's rated for like a million ISO or some kind of crazy thing. That I'm kind of, yeah, I don't know about that. That's like shooting infrared, you know, it's crazy. But this, this will give you a good idea, and, and you have that on your sheet. 
This gives you an idea of what you should do, and you won't get mixed up because you see the big opening versus the small opening and the whole ISO thing. And that works out pretty well. Here's a good depth of field exercise, right? If you're selling a guitar, you can read the name here, right? But the guy that's in the background, a member of the band, is out of focus. So this, shallow depth of field, all the way to the back, he's out of focus. The next shot, basically the same shot. Now he's in focus and the guitar is out. A shot like this is a difficult shot, depending on your angle, to get the entire thing in focus. Even with F22, it would be rough to have this and that because they're not that far apart. So what you can do to fix that is to come up a little bit and put that plane of focus a little closer and then it'll, it'll all fall into play. But this is a good example of you know, back and forth focus. It's like pulling focus in video. You'll see that a lot of times if you're watching a movie. You'll see the person in the foreground's in focus and he's talking to somebody in the background and they're out of focus. And then when he turns and talks to them, they pull focus and they put the person in the background in focus. It's the same kind of thing. So they're playing around with the, you know, the f-stop. Now this shot this is one of my favorite shots to discuss depth of field with. This was, this is funny, this is 250th of a second, 5.6 at ISO 400. No joke. I remember this because I, I was shooting it purposely. Um, this right here is, a, is the part of a cattle fence, right? So it's a round pole. So now if that was a greater depth of field, that round pole would be in focus and it would be going right through his neck. So it would be very, very distracting. At this point, you don't pay any attention to it because it's completely out of focus, so it doesn't really come into play. Right? So things like that, to be able to control, really helps because distracting backgrounds are really distracting. It takes away from the subject. So when you look at this photo, the only thing you see is the guy. You're not saying, oh, wow, that's, you know, look at that pole going through his neck or what's going on back there. Basically, you don't see anything going on back there because it's all completely out of focus. So this shot, one of the key things when you're photographing anything now, I get a lot of people that send me photographs and they'll say, what do you think of this picture? Now, I don't like to be cruel in any way, but there's a lot of times where I have to look at it and try and figure out what they were photographing. So it's really important to be clear on what the subject is that you're photographing. So don't just take a random shot. I mean, a random shot of a mountain or something is fine, but it there has to be a mountain there too. So there was a, you know, I mean, so it's just it's a random shot of something. It looks like somebody just said, yeah, that looks like, ah, I'll take a picture. And then send it, you know, so somebody had sent in this picture to me and said, do me a favor, can you put this out on your social media and vote for me? My picture's in a contest. And I looked at it and I was like, but what is it? And I couldn't figure out what they had in mind. It was this random photo. And it was, a, it was a horizon line, but it didn't have anything in it. It was really boring. I mean, and I felt bad. It was very well exposed. Everything else was fine, but there was no subject. So it's really important to when somebody, you show somebody a photograph, you want them to say, oh, that's really nice. I mean, you, know, you obviously have a subject there that they see, whether it's a building, a person, or you know, whatever. This is a, a, just a, a guy working on his truck it's a super shallow depth of field. I just focused basically on the ring and let everything else go. You can see the side here. His hand was on a rocking chair out, on, on, out in South, Car uh, South Dakota. And you can see part of his finger is actually gone. Guy's 70-something years old. But when you want to draw yourself to the, to the photo, the first thing that's in focus and sharp is the ring. So it just draws your attention to it right away. There's no question at all what the subject is in this photo. So the power of the image is going to be in your subject. And, and the funny part, one of the things that I stress most with, with people is don't impress me with your gear. Impress me with your photographs. You can tell me you've got the greatest gear in the world, but if you're not giving me photographs that are they're knocking my socks off, then I'm, I'm not impressed. You can't tell me you've got this great, great camera and then show me like mediocre pictures. And, and so work on your subject matter. 
of the greatest stories I ever had, one of the first photo walks I ever did in New York City with a whole group of people. The best pictures of the day, absolutely hands down better than mine, better than anybody else that was there, was a little girl that showed up with a point and shoot camera with double A batteries in it, and she just crushed everybody. Her composition and her photos were outstanding. I was just like, wow, I want to be able to put my name on those. They're awesome. And she's, she, in the first five minutes, her batteries went dead. Luckily, I had a whole bandolier of double A's, and I fed her full of double A's all day. And it was just an amazing thing. But she was just, every time I turned around, she'd show me another photograph that was amazing. And she had, by far, the beginning of the, the, the photo walk, she said, I really think that I'm just going to kind of bow out because everyone else has really big, fancy cameras. And I'm like, no, 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 don't, don't be silly. It's, it's all about subject. It's all about your, you know, your photos and how good they are. Not, don't worry about you know, what, what everybody else has. <laughs> At the end of the day, everybody else was just like, woo, <laughs> this girl is really good. I mean, everybody else said the same thing. They were all, we were all sitting in a Starbucks looking, passing cameras around. And when they got to her camera, this thing is this big. You know, and it's this cheap, like, HP camera. It wasn't even a name brand. And we just looked at the back, and we were just like, wow, these are amazing. So don't be intimidated by someone's gear. Just make great pictures, you know? Be, be powerful. Get your subject going, because that makes the world a difference when you start doing stuff like that. So now here you go from, this is F8, right? So F8 in the subway with a wider angle lens, everything's in focus, including my knee. So you want to get something like this in focus so that you, you can see what everybody's doing. And it's funny because no one's paying attention to anything except either their phone or just hoping to get home. So depth of field here is front to back at F8. Wider angle lenses tend to give you greater depth of field overall. So if you're shooting with a wide angle at F8, it's going to give you a much greater depth of field than if you're shooting at F8 with a 200 millimeter, because the big lenses compress things. Now this shot, great depth of field. That was F16. And this was out in, in South Dakota as well. But I wanted to get that mountain in the background, the cars. It's called Hot Rod Lake. This is out in the middle of nowhere. It's on private property. And they have all these old cars, and they circle the lake. That's the. The landscape of the lake are all these old cars. Really interesting place. But this uh, a friend of mine, Joe Morton and Chopper, his dog, is great. He's a fire-breathing bartender. So he goes to all these biker bars, and we teased him because the, uh, the full throttle saloon, right after Joe left, burned to the ground. <laughs> and it was online everywhere. And we were, I sent him a message, and I'm like, what did you do with the full throttle? That was his gig. That was he was out there, and, and the place burned to the ground. But he's an interesting guy. His dog's getting a little bit old. Um, he sets up his car. He's got a Volkswagen van. He sets up the van, opens up the side door, and he puts caution tape around the side. And his dog will come out and stay in the caution tape and just hang out outside the van. And it's really funny. He's like the center of attention at any of the, uh, any of the uh, events at that. All right, so let's talk about now. Let's move on from the depth of field thing into freezing motion. Right, so shot like this, right into the sun, I purposely wanted to silhouette that guy, and I wanted to freeze that motion. Now, he wasn't going that fast, so he was kind of gliding in the air. So that was a 500th of a second, and I was able to capture that without too much trouble. Right, so long exposures, shutter priority, again, or manual, whatever you want to do. The streaks you see here are lights from cars going through. The cars are passing through that shot, and the only thing they leave behind are the streaks. So with long exposures, you can do some very strange things with long exposures. If your camera's open, say for one second, and you walk through the frame, you don't even show up. You're just invisible. You'll walk right through the frame. Your shadow just goes away, unless you stop for a second. You can have an awful lot of fun doing that. You walk in, you stop, and then walk through. And you've got this <laughs> ghosted, weird image of yourself doing strange things. But, so this is a 15 second exposure. This was shot at, at F11, and it was at ISO 100 because I was on a tripod under a bridge in the rain, and I got the wet streets and different stuff there. Um, 
The reason it was 15 seconds, I picked 15 seconds because it took 15 seconds for the cars to go completely through the shot. And I wanted it to be all the way through. I tried a shorter duration, and then when the shutter stopped, so did the car. So now you had lights that just stopped here or here or wherever. So I made it 15 seconds, adjusted my aperture accordingly to get it to the right exposure, and then just shot that straight through. So that's the kind of thing, if you shoot, um, if you're going to take pictures of like fireworks and things like that, long exposures for fireworks work the best. So trying to pick your camera up and wait for that firework to go up and then grab that shot, usually it's kind of blurry and ugly. You do need, you should be on a tripod and you just open the camera up when it goes up and when it bursts and comes down, you capture the entire thing and then you know you can shut the camera off. You have to judge your exposure. There's no one exposure that works because fireworks are all different, you know, different colors. Unless you have an iPhone and then you just take the picture with your iPhone and it comes out perfect. <laughs> Or, or you know, a Samsung or whatever. It's crazy. Some of the pictures I've seen of fireworks that people have taken on their phones have been amazing. I don't know how that how that does that, but they're grainy and terrible, but they look cool on the screen. Yeah. So this shot, you're standing still. Everything here is standing still. The guy on a motorcycle is coming through, so he blurs. So that's what I was saying before about shots in New York. You want to blur the taxis. That's basically what I did here. Just hung out, took this shot, and the motorcycle blurs, but everything else is nice and clear. So that's a slow shutter. That was actually on a mirrorless camera. You know, I think it was on my uh, GH2, actually. When you have a mirrorless camera, it's an interesting concept. Uh, this is the new Panasonic GX85. It has, what, shown five? points of image stabilization and built in the body. So, and there's no mirror bouncing around. So if I hold still at a 15th of a second or a 10th of a second at something like this, I can actually pull that off holding still with this camera because it, of the amount of image stabilization that's built into the camera. The mirrorless stuff um, overall for, for long exposures handheld are definitely hands down better than anything else because you, can, you don't have that mirror bounce. The smoke going across, this was shot on a point and shoot camera. I just waited for that smoke, for the wind to blow. It framed out everything. The lady was crossing the street. It was, I don't remember the exposure on that because it was a point and shoot and it was actually on auto, but I just wanted to compose it that way. So the smoke looked perfect. It's a little blurry because there's a little bit of motion in there, but the rest of it's completely frozen. Depth of field, All right? So I wanted to get this shot. I came outside. This was a day that they had 42nd Street closed down in the center lane because they had, the UN was in session. So they had a police officer out there who was directing traffic in that center lane for all the cars going back and forth. And if you look closely, this bride was being, there's a pho photographer on the other side. So the bride was being photographed, and I'm, pro I, I'm definitely in his shot because I got him in mind. But it was a great shot because it was pretty cool. She was out there, and, he, and the cop paid no attention to her at all. He, she just did what her, you know, she was, I don't even know half the time he didn't know what she was doing. He knew the lane was blocked, so he wasn't really bothering her. But it was a cool shot. And you guys probably all know where that is, right? It's right under the overpass there of, of Grand Central. But it's a really, uh, and this is the kind of case where if I did real shallow depth of field, none of the stuff in the background would have been readable. So in this, in this case, the bikes, the signage, and everything else made a lot more sense. This was just a shot that I did with something called a lens baby, right? So you focused in on this, and everything else kind of blurred. But something like this, there's something called leading lines, right, with composition. So leading lines tend to run your eye to your subject. So you've got these benches going this way, kind of runs your eye right to the subject. When I talked about the leading lines and the lens baby, see how this is all blurry on the side here? The reason it's blurry is not because I, it's a special lens that does that weird, it's a lens baby you actually mount on the camera and it pivots and you move it and it has something called a sweet spot and the sweet spot is wherever you want to put it and that actually created that, that type of a blur on the outside. All right, we're gonna move into what we call white balance. 
Now, this is, hopefully this doesn't scare you too much. These are the colors of presets that you have in your camera that adjust the color of light. So you have your camera come from the factory, it comes with an auto white balance, AWB. So the auto white balance, normally, everybody uses auto white balance most of the time. If you decide you're going to change your white balance to, to emulate any of these other colors or help you out, you need to remember to always change it back. Auto white balance generally picks the strongest light source to adjust to, which in most cases, your camera on auto white balance, I leave my camera on auto white balance until I change it. Because if I put it on one of the other white balances and then I go somewhere and I forget to put it back, which everyone does, then the colors come out all weird. So auto white balance for your general, general shooting outside and stuff usually works pretty well. But if you're going with a subject, say you're taking pictures of a person outside and you're going from sun to shade, when you go from the sun, you're on auto white balance, you go from the sun into the shade, there's a real good chance, and I just did this in my last workshop, that person goes from being warm color-wise and looking normal to looking very cool and very blue when they go in the shade. So that's why you have a shade mode. So if you take these presets in your camera, which they'll pop up if you go to your white balance menu, all these presets pop up. You go to your shade mode, what the shade mode does is adds more yellow to your shot to make it look like it was in like the daylight mode, in the, in the sun, right? So that's why it's, it's important if you're going to do things outside, if it's a continually sunny, nice day, you can put your white balance on daylight and walk around and shoot all you want. But if you do go in the shade and you're shooting a subject that you want to look the same, skin tone wise, then you need to kind of bounce back and forth from either cloudy, shade, or daylight. Because cloudy and overcast adds a little bit of yellow on a cloudy day to make it look like the daylight mode. And then the shade mode adds even more, because shade's very cool. So it has a little more yellow. And it all tries to keep these two making it look like that. And it does actually work pretty well. Auto white balance is an interesting setup because what happens is, and I learned this the hard way, I set up a gray background and I set up studio lighting. And I was gonna photograph 25 lawyers in the New York Times building, right? Big fancy job set up in this big conference room. I shot it and I forgot that I was in auto white balance. Well, what happens is auto white balance takes into consideration the subject, colors that the subject might have on. So if you want the gray background to be gray the entire time, auto white balance is not the way to go. So I wound up, the people all look good to me because I was looking at it on the back of my camera. But when I got home, put it on the computer, my gray background was all over the place. A little green, a little magenta, a little this, a little of that. Where if you locked it into the flash mode or whatever color lights you're using, it doesn't change. People still look the same, everything looks fine, but the background looks the same. You would think, I'm in auto white balance, nothing has changed, my light's the same, everything's the same, it's a gray background. It should be fine, it doesn't. It takes into consideration their coloring, and what they're wearing and everything else. So it will change things. So if you want locked in continuous tones, you need to use one of these presets. Now the tungsten incandescent mode, if you're ever taking photographs outside and you wind up with blue photographs, that's why. Um, fluorescent lighting, uh, for the most part, the auto white balance does a pretty good job on fluorescence, but nowadays, most fluorescents are, are daylight balanced, so it works out pretty well. But if you look around, if you go in, if you look in any of the buildings, you look up, fluorescent lights tend to be a bunch of different colors. So if you use the fluorescent filter uh, in your, your white balance setting, um, it will clean it up a little bit. You have to kind of test it and see what it's gonna look like. Uh, most of the time it does kind of whiten up those lights. Uh, flash mode, as soon as you put a flash on your camera or turn the flash on, your white balance normally goes to the flash setting, which is essentially daylight. Because 
flashes are basically balanced for daylight. Uh, so you have daylight mode up here, which is outside under, under the sun, and you have tungsten, which is like an incandescent type old style light bulb. It says 60 watt light bulb, but it's, 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 you can use it for, it says, it, it says it doesn't usually work for halogen. That's not necessarily true. I've had, you know, like if you have a, a modern kitchen that has a bunch of hi-hat lights that are coming out of the, the ceiling, they're usually pretty yellow, and they look terrible when you take a picture of anyone in the house. This is going to make a big difference for you. That's going to whiten those lights, and it's going to make it look much, much better. So um, any, any questions on, on these guys? This is something that you could, what I suggest you do with this, there's some people that say, I shoot in cloudy all the time because I like the way it looks. Now, in some cameras, it does warm things up and saturate the colors a little bit. A lady shooting Central Park, she shot on the cloudy mode all day long in all different situations. Sometimes it's a little weird. Um, I don't like my green trees to look gold when they're not supposed to. And sometimes it makes people look like they have a really bad spray tan. You know? So you've got to be careful with that. You've got to watch what you're doing as far as the white balance is concerned. You want to be able to keep your white balance. I mean, like I said, auto is probably good for most of this stuff. I wouldn't run around outside all day long trying to do custom, you know, do white balances everywhere because it's basically a lot of work and you're not getting any photos. You want to spend as little time as possible doing all these different things, kind of figure out ahead of time what you want to do rather than trying to do it at the spur of the moment. So basically, if you're going to photograph a parade, you want to preset some stuff. Don't be doing it while the parade's going past you and you're missing out on everything and you're trying to figure out what your settings are. All right, white balance. Here's a perfect example. This was taken now. Auto white balance here was just completely ultimately confused. No one knew what, you know, there were all different color lights here. There was all kinds of different things. So this is just shot in auto white balance. And this was just done with a, with a little bit of correction. You see the difference in the lighting? It goes from yellow to where the white on the front of the motorcycle is actually white instead of yellow. But under a situation like this, even auto white balance, it's really, really hard to try and figure out anything. And to try and do a custom white balance, so you do a custom white balance in one spot, and then in the back, it's another color. So there's lights all over the place. But these are white here. The Jim Beam sign is white. And then there's white back here. So whatever, this guy, actually, that headlight had a little bit of yellow in it. It was designed that way. But the white here but it's really a difficult situation. So the skyline photos, see what I've got here. <laughs> you guys want something interesting, I gotta keep you awake. All right, so things are not always as they seem, okay? So something like this, I saw, it was really funny because I saw these, this was on St. Patrick's Day. Now, now these are very, you know, I thought were Catholic nuns walking around. They're walking toward me, and they got the little shamrock on their face and everything else, and one guy's yelling at me, no, 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 you got to see their back. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And then the one turned around, and so they were actually, they were not actually nuns. But I was able to grab a couple of shots of them. But it's a, it, was a, it was a fun day. So that's just to keep you awake. All right, another, another example of, of white balance. All right, so this was done with a flash. Everything worked out just perfect. This white turned out white, and this guy with the flash, everything was balanced out. I didn't have to do anything. I just grabbed a quick picture. Again, that's why he's got a green mohawk, St. Patty's Day. You definitely don't want to be at Bike Week during St. Patrick's Day. They, they only did that one year, and then they changed it again because it was so insane that it was just beyond anything anybody could imagine. They had things that were just green pudding wrestling and things like that. It was very, yeah, it was just crazy. But anyway, so this was a flash, a little fill flash. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it took me quite a while to clean the pudding out of my cameras. It was funny because it got, you know, it got splattered right on the front of the, right in the, I had, you figure you got the camera and you're gonna get hit on the lens. You know, so I'm trying to get the lens out of the way I turned to look down, and, and 
pudding came up and came down and went right into my eyepiece. Just splat. And it was just like, okay, next camera. Just grabbed the other camera and started using it. It took me forever to get that stuff out of there. So, but you trying to do this shot without using a fill flash would have never worked. He was standing in total darkness. So I used very little flash and I just popped it in there and used it on the background as well. So when I talk about flash like this, in your camera, even if you have a built-in built flash in your camera, there's something called flash exposure compensation. So now you have a little lightning bolt, and then with that little lightning bolt, you have the plus and minus. So you can look in your camera manual, and you'll find that little plus and minus. So now what that does is that turns down or up just the power of the flash. Doesn't affect your exposure. It's only using the power of the flash to either go brighter or darker. So if you're outside and you're trying to power, overpower daylight, you can use it on the plus side. And if you want to just have a hint to make it look relatively natural, you can turn the power down. And it only affects the power coming out of the flash, not your exposure. Anybody try and shoot the moon? Try and take a picture of the moon? Everybody wants to try to do it. One of the most difficult things to do, trying to take a photograph of the moon. Moon is way, way brighter than you think. So I've, I've read things online. It's really kind of funny to listen to it. Best way to shoot the moon is put it on automatic. Good luck with that. First of all, the flash goes off. Uh, I think the moon's a little too far away. The flash isn't going to help you out. But when you photograph the moon, Normally what you're going to do, you're going to aim your camera, get it right square in the center, and you're going to take a meter reading off the moon, which is going to be a big white fireball. And it's going to be totally overexposed until you adjust your camera and adjust it down to start seeing things and to see some footprints over here from where the guys were on the moon. Um, so you adjust your exposure and underexpose until you get to the point where you start seeing detail because otherwise the moon is just a giant ball of fire. So now, when you have a shot, I'm gonna go to the next one, uh, hang on, I'm gonna go back. I got one shot, I wanna show this one shot, this shot. This shot of Skyline was, was done by a friend of mine. I can't take credit for it. We were doing a Hoboken photo walk and we were out on a really windy night. And this shot is done at, with auto white balance because we tried all of the white balances and none of them worked as good as auto. Auto worked perfect, right? So it's auto white balance, it's F16, a 30 second exposure at ISO 100. Done on a tripod, obviously, 30 seconds long. So you see the water the water is all moving because the tide's going out. So it's nice and soft and smooth. But everything else is nice and tack sharp. Now this, we were talking about this. This is a golf driving range, which really annoyed me because those lights are so bright and it really ruins the shot. I mean, you could kind of crop them out if you wanted to or just you know, take them out in Photoshop. But at F16, usually anything above F11, you get that star effect on some of the lights because it's a natural occurrence at, at that kind of an aperture, that small of an aperture. So you get that star effect that wasn't done purposely. Now another thing, so at 30 seconds, anything that's in this shot that's moving is going to be blurred. So the water's blurry, the clouds are a little blurry. So now the one thing that this shot doesn't have, and that's a moon, if it had a moon, and you did a 30 second exposure, the moon would not be round because of the rotation of the earth and in 30 seconds, the moon would be oblong. So now you would have to adjust your exposure accordingly because you don't think of that. You think, I'm gonna just do this 30 second exposure and why in the world does that moon look so weird? Because it's in that short period of time, in 30 seconds, you get a really oblong moon. So that beautiful round moon is not going to work. Now also, we lucked out in this shot because there were no helicopters, because the helicopters would have ruined the shot, because it would come in, it would start flying through, and if it only flew through partially, 
through the exposure, it would be a streak all the way along with the light. You wouldn't see the helicopter itself, you would just see the light. So it would be a disaster. This night turned out perfect. And that was shot, this is as is in camera, and it was shot as a JPEG. And John sent it to me just, he shoots raw and JPEG as well, but he shot this and sent me to JPEG and uh, made me green with envy. Um, when you take a long exposure like this, it's like looking through a pair of binoculars. If there's any motion in the camera whatsoever at that distance, you look through binoculars and you shake a little bit, if you take your camera and it shakes at all, everything out here is gonna be blurry. So what John did, these people out here, they were out on this dock, they weren't with my group. They were out on this dock with tripods photographing the skyline. The dock is a floating dock. So when you're on a dock that floats when you've got a tripod, the buildings on the other side are not floating. So you're moving. So every shot, I could, they kept complaining that their shots were out of focus <laughs> because they were bouncing up and down. So John was over here on the other side and he had actually taken, he was shooting with a cannon at the time and he actually took his lens, he had it on a tripod, he put the lens down on the railing and taped it so that it couldn't move. This shot, I, this was totally by accident, it was one of these things where I was trying to uh, check out my lighting and then I was in Disney World, obviously, but didn't know that Mickey was going to shoot sparks out of his fingers. I was just like, wow, well, okay, Mickey's out on stage. Let me just see what my meter reading is, my color balance and all that stuff. And all of a sudden that happened. And I was like, wow, being in the right place at the right time, huh? And Disney went crazy when they saw that shot. They were like, oh, they were retweeting it and sending it all over the place. And I was just like, you know, I just got lucky. So anyway, I appreciate everybody that's here and putting up with me for two hours. Thank you very much. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.